This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. On this episode, former Demos president Heather McGee talks about her book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. She's interviewed by author and Harvard University professor Khalil Gibran Muhammad. I am so delighted to be here today with Heather McGee, someone of whom I am a huge fan I got to know her when she was the president of Demos and everything she's done both there and since I've been incredibly inspired by. I think she's one of the fiercest thinkers and doers uh, in our country right now. And I'm so delighted to have this opportunity uh, to sit down with her today and talk about this fabulous new book she's written. This book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper together. Thank you so much, Heather, for doing this work and for being who you are in the world. Uh, Thank you so much for saying all of that. It was really quite generous. I am a huge fan um, with so much respect for your work. It really did influence so much of my thinking. Um, So this is a really exciting conversation for me. Yeah. Well, listen, I think this is an incredible moment. And so uh, I have a question later on about COVID writing because it seems you must have done a fair, a fair amount of it. But we'll, we'll get to that. I think the first thing um, that would be really great for the viewers is to get to, little, to, get to know you a little bit. Um, you, you write about yourself. You write about your mom. You write about Chatham. Uh, one of the things that's uh, Chatham being the neighborhood that, uh, that you grew up in, also being my childhood neighborhood. And so I know that. <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So so here we are, both Chicagoans, right, a city that in so many ways epitomizes both the, the best of the black traditions, the first um, black person after Reconstruction uh, to go to Congress in 1928, Oscar Dupriest, uh, a place that has stood in the image of America as a place of the city of broad shoulders, for example, uh, and yet so much of what we've talked about over Chicago in the last four years has been the violence in that city. So let's just start with your personal story. Let's talk a little bit about how your own coming of age story informs this book. Well, thank you so much for that question. Um, I do believe we we can't pretend like we are objective observers of our times. We are rooted in place and time. And for me, I think my being born on and then really moving every single year, it felt like uh, all around Chicago, um, being born on the south side of Chicago and then moving all around Chicago um, in the 1980s was very formative because it was really a time of dramatic upheaval in the economy. Um, Chicago, which was such a source for the great migration, was such a place of intense white ethnic immigrant settlement. Um, It was a place with a huge manufacturing base, not just the auto industry, but food manufacturing and paper manufacturing. Um, And there were good jobs there. And it was a place where there were also, there was a big public sector, right? It was the city that works. My my grandmother and my grandfather, my grandfather was a Chicago police officer in the 1960s. Um, That could be its own book. Um, My grandmother was a a guidance counselor, social worker in the Chicago public schools. Um, And yet in the 1980s, we really started to see in a very observable, visceral way, what happened when the social contract unraveled, when manufacturing began to be outsourced and automated, and when there were cutbacks in social infrastructure and government spending. And I really grew up seeing what it was like when the rug was pulled out from under a a sort of really striving Black working middle class. Yeah, that's one of the parts of the book that I think is really helpful for your readers is this way in which you describe a sense of loss over time, uh, a childhood that that witnessed uh, the rich diversity within the Black community. And although the context of segregation, which is another concept that you explode in many ways, um, meant that Black people were, by dint of laws and policies, forced to live in a confined uh, space, Nevertheless, you saw tremendous richness and diversity and humanity and people of all stripes, uh, 
It did not encourage you to think about black people through very narrow lens, uh, something that changed for you. So talk a little bit about that change, about the leaving Chicago to go to school elsewhere on the East Coast. Yeah, when I was just in middle school, um, I went away to boarding school. So moving from Illinois to uh, Massachusetts, not just Massachusetts, but rural Massachusetts to an all white town that was a designated historical town. So there were more, uh, you know, horse drawn carriages than there were black people in this town. <laughs> um, I was one of just a few black children at the school. It was a really a sort of unheard of move for my parents to make, but they were, um, you know, doing it out of this sense that I was this restless kid and that I wasn't being served well by the public schools. Um, and so um, that meant that I sort of saw for the first time what white people, particularly on the East Coast, sort of thought about black people, black people who had been you know, in my experience, every single type of human being, right? Um, and in particular on the East Coast in the Boston area in Massachusetts, there was very much a sense that Black meant poor um, in a way that was not my experience. Um, was that we didn't have poor Black people and poor Black cousins and that we weren't in the fragile middle class ourselves, for sure. But there was very much, I think, for the first time I experienced being reflected to me both the sense of a hierarchy of human value very, very starkly, and also uh, a sense that, real, a realization that white people didn't know very much about us, right? Even though we, um, where I was born was a very segregated place, it was over 90% Black, um, of course we knew about white people, right? They were my parents' co-workers and my teachers and, of course, everybody on screen. But it created this, this real cost to the white people I then went on to meet that they just really didn't have a full picture of who ultimately their fellow Americans were. Yeah, this is uh, maybe to, to sort of cut to the chase on one of the key terms that you invert uh, in this book uh, is the very notion of segregation. Uh, that out of this formative experience, the shift from an all black segregated or overwhelmingly black segregated community to an overwhelmingly segregated white community, to put words in your mouth, essentially you say black people, even within that space, didn't have the luxury of not knowing white people. They were all around on at borders, on television, in charge, running the city. Yeah. And yet white people had huge deficit with regard to their lived experience. So segregation, I think counterintuitive to a lot of uh, people who will read your book, was costly to them also. The entire premise of my book um, is to, find, to round out the picture. So often we talk about the impact of racism on the targeted folks, Black folks, Brown folks, Indigenous folks, Indigenous folks. And that is absolutely the center of the story. But if we zoom out, I think it's really important to see that racism is such a pernicious, distorting force that it has, it has costs for everyone. And so the chapter on segregation in my book really tries to invert our normal way of thinking that it's us who are segregated away from the white people, um, to recognize that white people are in fact the most segregated people in America. They are the most racially isolated um, and in many ways are increasingly racially isolated at a time of rising diversity. And so that chapter goes through the many different costs, physical, educational, emotional, interpersonal, that segregation has not just the well enumerated costs on black and brown people, but the costs for white people too. Yeah, yeah you're, you're in conversation uh, at times with, with Robin D'Angelo, both as someone you interviewed and also with her work, White Fragility, which has of course been one of the most read books on anti-racism in the post George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor moment. And uh, you use her to talk about the fact that most white people are socialized into thinking that an all white space uh, is somehow both normal and ideal. Uh, mm -hmm. That in fact, the absence of people of color uh, somehow isn't a problem. Um, I remember an interview she gave with Rebecca uh, 
um, Carol on her on her podcast, and and it was so poignant uh, the way that she described it. And so one of the things you talk about is the fact that white people actually even do better in integrated schools, contrary to <laughs> to popular myth. That's right. I think it was really my my book um, took me on a journey across the country, um, talking to hundreds of people, a few dozen of these really um, compelling stories ended up in the book. But I talked to hundreds of people, including uh, a number of parents of all races who were dealing with the cost of segregation to their own families, to their own children, to the education that their, in, in some cases, white children um, were, was the, the education that was available to them. Um, and it turns out that diversity does something, particularly for white students and white um, employees and adults on teams, that increases critical thinking, that sort of puts people people on their toes, that increases empathy and a lot of the indicators of you know, positive citizenship. This kind of diversity and integration is a positive and normative good. And so it was really important when I just was bowled over by the depth of the social science research for me to tell the story of a number of white families um, that were able to do what was not encouraged by their community, which is to seek out um, global majority schools. Yeah, I, I love that term. And as someone who reads some of the same research, I had not actually heard that term. You use the term global majority in, in an interview, or at least it comes up in an interview uh, with a multiracial woman who's decided to take her kids um, out of a, out of a high achieving, good performing school. Maybe tell us a little bit about her and her journey, because I think it's revealing of uh, the choices. At, at the end of the day, this is a book about choices, um, mm -hmm. and she made a different choice. Yeah, um, her name is Ali Takata. She was um, half Japanese and half white, and she grew up in a largely white suburb of Hartford, Connecticut. And when she had two young children, she moved, she and her husband moved to Austin, Texas. And it's so funny, right? You move to a city and you sort of learn, okay, what are the rules? Where do you live? What are the schools like? All these questions that you have as a parent. She was, you know, pushed in all these little ways by housing prices that were higher and neighborhoods that were well, you know, in, encouraged by real estate brokers and by school rating systems like uh, greatschools.org into the part of Austin that is highly segregated and white. And she spent about a year with her children in that very good school, highly rated, highly segregated white privileged school, and realized that it wasn't conforming to her values to send her children to that kind of um, school environment. And so she did something on her own. And I think she very beautifully said, if the city wasn't going to desegregate our schools, um, I was going to do it for myself, for our family. And so she ends up sending her two children to a school in East Austin, which is the more black and brown neighborhood. Um, and the whole family finds it to be a much more enriching experience that comports with their values. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was really a, a beautifully told story and, and very uh, clear example of really at the very micro level, because this is a book that I think so beautifully captures the big and the small and puts them in conversation with each other, uh, how people define both their own individual well-being, but also the common good quite differently. And it seems to me that um, what you show repeatedly uh, in the arc of the book is that uh, for a concentrated number of overwhelmingly, I guess, to some degree, middle income to affluent whites in a place like Austin, Texas, as opposed to, say, Covington, Kentucky, um, these white parents are looking for something in terms of the metric of privilege, uh, of what will guarantee material well-being, uh, for their children. And they may be right about that. I mean, you don't pull any punches in suggesting that the school that the parent uh, who made a different choice had lower test scores, but 
something about the balance and trade-off between our individual choices and the privileges some of us have to exercise those choices yields um, different metrics. And I guess that's what I want to spend some time with. So let's talk a little bit about Demos because a lot of people won't know the organization. And I think given if I get the structure of this book right, so much of what informs your experience with, with, with parents like the one you just described and with so many other from auto workers uh, uh, in, in um, Tennessee, for example, is, is Demos. So tell us a little bit about Demos and let's get into some of those other stories. So I had the privilege of spending nearly 20 years helping to build and then becoming president of a nonpartisan, nonprofit think, think tank uh, called Demos. Demos is the Greek word for the people of a nation, and it's the root word of democracy. And our mission was to advance policy solutions to inequality in our economy and our democracy. And for me, largely because of that upbringing in what we now know to be the beginning of the inequality era, where um, we really began to see the quality of life of working and middle class folks start to stall out and decline, even while so much more money was being made at the very top of the income distribution. I was truly focused for most of my career on this question of how can we have more people taste the kind of economic freedom and economic security that's supposed to be the American birthright, that's supposed to be the American dream, as it was um, being uh, sort of snatched away from more and more people over the course of you know, the past two generations. And so I was lucky enough to have, you know, what in many ways was my dream job using research and advocacy to help bring policymakers' attention to the issues that were keeping working families up at night. Health care, the cost of college, the lack of child care, the unaffordability of housing, predatory lending, these kinds of just kitchen table bread and butter issues that were really economic issues. And I really understood these economic issues to be questions of tax policy, labor policy, financial regulation, all of these, you know, truly economic concerns. And yet I knew, obviously, as a Black woman and as a person who can read the data, that when policymakers make bad economic policy decisions, people of color, particularly my people, Black people, end up suffering the most from them because we are already saddled with discrimination and disadvantage. And so I understood the relationship between economic inequality and racism to flow kind of linearly, right? There's economic policy, there's, and it creates inequality, and then racism comes in and accelerates it for communities of color. But I ended up having a number of experiences over the course of my time trying to advocate for what seemed to me to be pretty obvious solutions to big economic policy problems. Um, For example, we know that college is now an important piece of middle class life. Didn't used to be, now it is. And yet it used to be free or virtually free when it was sort of not that necessary to have a middle class knife. And now that it's an essential ticket to the middle class, we've priced it out of reach for working class students. And so it seemed pretty obvious and has majority support that we should lower the cost of college to make it more affordable. And that student debt is actually a terrible economic policy to to encourage. And yet, there was so much resistance among policymakers to doing what seemed to be the obvious thing to help create a strong middle class. And so as it turns out, racism was playing a much more central role than I thought. It's not just that economic inequality was being accelerated by racism for communities of color. It was that racism was driving inequality for everybody. And it was that hunch that made me set out on this journey. I went from Maine to California, Mississippi, and back again, talking to people about not just the dollars and cents and the data that I knew from the spreadsheets on my computer, but rather the way people were understanding what ultimately is core questions about status and belonging, 
One of the inciting pieces of research that I read that sort of set me off on my journey was a set of um, research about the zero sum mindset that is increasingly um, a majority worldview among white Americans. The idea that there's sort of a, a fixed pie of equality. And so progress for one group has to come at the expense of the other. And that zero sum hierarchy, that sense of racial competition, even among our fellow country people, um, is what I saw really driving this stinginess to ourselves and this sort of sabotaging of our own broadly shared economic success. Yeah, I have so many thoughts um, just uh, in responses to what you said and, of course, to what I've read. Uh, so I want to try to, to put them in order that makes sense. But <laughs> one of the things that I think is so revealing about your book, uh, and I actually had a question about this, is when you were setting out to sort of define the book on its turn, in, its, in, in the way in which you constructed it, um, how much were you struck by other attempts to try to understand how middle income, low income white people who in some ways are the, I won't necessarily say they're the spine of the book, but, but they most certainly are part of the glue that holds the spine together. Um, because it seems to me that we get a lot of books in the, in the tradition of Arlie Hochschild's book uh, or Barbara Ehrenreich's work, um, books that take seriously the class, um, the class interests of working people of all backgrounds as the central driving force of the inequalities uh, mm -hmm. and the damage done in our society and this tension between elites and the people. And you do something quite differently uh, in this book. You, you really tease out that the divide and conquer strategy of which you've just you know, sort of defined in a social scientific way as a zero sum theory, um, for you is real. I mean, it's not just a, a kind of fanciful thing that working people use in an act or gesture of solidarity. Um, but part of what this book does is it, it speaks directly to everyday people to say, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like over different periods of time. Each book has a historical context to understand how that divide and conquer start strategy began, how it evolves and the choices in front of people uh, to move forward. So I, the, the question in there is precisely, um, how conscious of you with trying to say something new about that? So I, I definitely grew up sort of intellectually in terms of what I studied and learned in my career in the sort of class first Mm -hmm. um, school of thought around economic inequality and economic policy, right? That's just, that's what you do when you're writing and learning and, and advocating and researching on, on the economy. You learn about the economy as it's taught. Um, and in that school of thought, race is often an afterthought. And if it's an afterthought, we talk about it in terms of disparities, right? The advantages basically of racial discrimination and structural racism that accrue to white people and the disadvantages to people of color. But it also seemed really clear to me that people like Arlie Hochschild, I read um, Strangers in Their Own Land, you know, actually very much at the beginning of my journey, it's one of the first books that I read. Um, and when she talks about the deep story that her interview subjects who are white Tea Party adherents in um, Louisiana, in a, in a very environmentally degraded, economically struggling environment, who are so adamantly opposed to government under President Obama, um, that they would be willing to sort of accept all of the impacts of not having uh, any government regulation on the polluters in their community. Their houses are literally sinking into the ground. The, their ponds and the rivers that they fish from are dying. They're all getting cancer. I mean, it's really life and death stakes. And yet they still reject government and hew to the corporate actors in their community, even as the corporate actors are literally polluting them and poisoning them and killing them. And she talks about the deep story and she really takes it on, takes them on face value, these white Americans, by when they say that they are not racist, you know, that they know Black people in church, they have Black friends, et cetera, they are not racist. 
And yet they have this deep story that is about people cutting in line for the American dream. And, you know, for me, I see race all in that story because the line cutters are largely people of color and the Obamas are the most emblematic version of those line cutters. And so I wanted to dig a little bit deeper and go where the social science research tells us about how implicit bias works, how it is that um, questions of, of status and hierarchy are racialized in the American context. And most importantly, be very clear that this zero sum story, the idea that white people should be threatened by the presence of more people of color at a time of demographic change and by symbols of increasing power among people of color, that white people should really see that not only as a threat, but so much of a threat that it would change their public policy opinions on issues like raising the minimum wage, taxes and spending, drilling in the Arctic even, right? The idea that you would become more conservative because there are more people of color and there's the possibility that people of color may share power in what has been a white dominant society. That is a story that is as old as the founding of this country. And it is a lie. And it was really important for me to go back to the beginning and talk about why we created this zero sum story to justify slavery and genocide and an economic system that really was my profit at your loss. And recognize that that is no longer obviously our economic system and the parts of our economic system that still have that kind of cruelty are ones that we want to reject, we want to put behind us. And yet hewing to that gut level sense that the presence or progress of people of color is a threat to white people um, is, is, is really what is holding us back. And it has always been a pretty tiny self-interested elite that has sold and aggressively marketed that story. That's one of the things that was very important to me to put as much attention on the people who were selling that zero sum story for their own profit than as much attention as to the people who were desperate enough to buy that story. Yeah, you yeah, know, I was going to I was going to ask you about those elites because it, it it seems to me that part of the way an organization like and and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but most think tanks whether this applies to Demos most explicitly or in, implicitly, uh, but generally imagine that their theory of change uh, is think tanks, again, not grassroots advocacy groups, think tanks, uh, is to present data and research to uh, elite decision makers, whether they are formally in electoral politics or whether they are policy makers or whether they sit in the ecosystem uh, of uh, university trained people, people like myself, for example, um, mm -hmm. who have a platform for influence. And there's a give and take between, you know, new research and new presentations of data and uh, upstream decision making, you know, here's, you know, here's how we ought to move forward. And, and I guess I took away from both the story you just told and the book itself is that there may be something about elites where they're never gonna change their behavior. Because at the end of the day, whether they sit on the Democratic side of the aisle or the Republican side of the aisle, they have never had to bear the cost of mm -hmm. segregation. You, you have this incredible uh, quote in the chapter on climate. You say, you're quoting someone. No, you're quoting yourself. I'm quoting you. <laughs> if you're in a society where you've already let someone go without shelter, then what does it matter if they drown? If it's okay for people, people to suffer, then it's okay for people to suffer. And if your wealth has protected you from that suffering, then your wealth can probably protect you from another kind of suffering. I just th think about that because I think about, you know, what are the drivers of change? What are the levers to pull? If you have to make trade-offs between who you convince to do something differently, to make different choices, where are you leaning into that? And I just wanted to hear your thoughts about the capacity of elites to actually give up this system yeah. as it is. Um, I didn't set out to write a chapter on climate change, um, but, you know, the urgency of the issue and also the stark racial divide that I quickly discovered, um, basically, and this runs counter to our kind of 
stereotypes of who environmentalists are, which is, you know, our stereotype is like a white backpacker, right, with a Patagonia vest on or something. But in fact, um, white people ha- are much less concerned about the risks and threats of climate change than our brown and black people. Um, and the people who are most likely to be climate change deniers uh, and opponents of climate change are white men. And so I did feel like then I had to ask those questions. So what, why? It doesn't really make sense. Why is it that white men would be more likely to not want to do something to save the planet that we all inhabit? And it ended up really coming down to that zero-sum worldview, to the worldview you just quoted, um, where, as social science researchers call it, um, it's a system justification, right? Basically, they've benefited from this current system, which you know broadly can be thought of as sort of an economically unequal concentrations of wealth and power and polluting extractive system, right? Where we, where we are okay with abusing animals, the land, resources, you know, people in the global south, the people who live in sacrifice zones, in mostly black and brown communities all over the country, right? All of those costs, it's okay for them to bear for the people on the economic top to, you know, to reap the benefit, right? So that is, again, that zero-sum idea. What I discovered, though, in the course of researching and traveling for that chapter on climate, which I called the same sky, Mm -hmm. is that ultimately it, like all of these aspects of the zero sum, has a limit. And at its core, it's an illusory concept because we actually do all live under the same sky. And the idea that that white men who are um, opposed to climate change can somehow escape the costs of climate change is a fallacy. Of course, they're disproportionately born by people at the bottom of the economic hierarchy. But, you know, climate change is coming for us all. So that's one piece of it. To your question about sort of, you know, elites and, and whether or not they will ever be sort of persuaded and what are the tools, I spent a long time in my course of work in economic research and advocacy trying to kind of answer the kind of prototypical white, moderate, or conservative who is sort of the gatekeeper to public policy, right? Whether or not this was seen as an okay um, solution to the problem, sort of what are the the confines of the debate, right? Those are white, moderate to conservative um, gatekeepers so often, usually male. And of course, whenever we as advocates wanted to do something that was in the public interest, regulate Wall Street, um, you know, put a price on carbon, you know, bring in more public benefits to the American people who are struggling. Um, They would say, but the economy, right? We can't spend so much because of the economy. We can't regulate so much for the economy. It's going to cost too much. The economy, the economy, the economy. So we would jump through hoops and say, actually, if you look at this, if we invest here, it's going to redound into more economic growth. Actually, the costs of regulation are always way overstated during the debate, and that in fact, there are often economic benefits to keeping people alive and having people be able to be productive and not polluting the natural resources that you depend on. And yet, it occurred to me that I was sort of running a a fool's errand to try to make a good faith economic argument Because what so often the sort of winners of the economic hierarchy today are defending is not the economy as it is learned in textbooks, which is the sum total of our goods and products and services, but the economy meaning the hierarchy that they are sitting atop. And that's what they want to protect. So it doesn't matter that climate change is already costing us $240 billion a year. There's not actually a trade-off between, between climate change, addressing climate change and economic growth and jobs. That's really clear now. But for people who are really invested in the polluting status quo and who are on sort of a gut level worried about sharing power, 
in the decision making, that's the threat. Yeah. You, I, I so remember the passage in the book when you talk exactly in those terms and you say, it's not the sum total of the economy that they say we have to protect the economy. You say, literally, it is their economy that they're concerned about. And I think that, you know, it, it, it gives me some hope that good diagnostics can lead to good outcomes, but it also um, gives me some sense of exasperation Mm-hmm. Um, that 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 is hard to overcome. Yeah, and so I want to I want you to talk a, a little bit about some of the histories you tell because as a historian, I spend a lot of time both broadening what people know, and I hope to talk a little bit about what little people or what how much people don't know um, in your own journey of education. Um, but also, history become these sort of parables, these sort of factual parables about choices people made in the past and all like any good Bible story or good story from the Torah, teach us something about our humanity and what we ought to learn about uh, the past. So you open the book. First of all, you've got this, this beautiful cover, um, this art uh, of someone jumping in a pool. It looks like a, a, a white boy uh, and a, a black child uh, coming out, maybe to join in, in the fun, coming out of the pool to dive off again. And uh, so just talk about these, this history of segregated swimming pools and the cost to everyone when those pools were too much for too many Southern communities to accept. So this is a piece of history that some people, when I start to tell the story, viscerally say, yeah, I remember this happening in my town. And then some people are shocked they've never heard about it. So it's often a sort of Rorschach test to kind of... Um, your own racial and historical literacy, right? That's right, exactly. Um, so in the early part of the 20th century, the United States invested in building over 2,000 grand resort-style public swimming pools. These weren't your backyard swimming pool. These weren't little watering holes. These are big, beautiful testaments to a government commitment to a just sort of high leisure focused quality of life. Um, They had a melting pot imperative as well. There was this idea that if we make public recreation in our cities and our towns, that our people will mix, um, that white ethnic immigrants, the sort of Americanizing force of this kind of level of of leisure and high quality of life. And they were paid for by public tax dollars all over the country. And they were largely, as most of the public free benefits in the course of the first half of the 20th century were, for whites only. Mm-hmm. When in the course of the civil rights movement, um, courts began to decree that these public pools being segregated was unconstitutional, because as Black folks argued, if our tax dollars paid for it, we should be able to enjoy it as well, there was a crisis rolling across the country. And it wasn't just in the South. I think it's really important to note that. It was in Ohio, New Jersey, California, Oregon. Um, All of these places where there was such a deep condemnation of Blackness, right? There was such a sense that Black people were to be distrusted and disdained, that the idea of sharing the pool with us was an anathema. So much of an anathema that towns did all these different strategies to try to get out of sharing the public pool with Black people. They would privatize them, right? They would sell them off into the YMCA, um, which was then a private institution. And so they could say, well, we'll sell them to the YMCA for a dollar. And then it's private. And so it can be members only, right? They took a public thing and made it private in order to avoid sharing it with all of the public. And then in so many towns, when that didn't work, they just drained the public pool. They filled it in with dirt, they paved it over and they seeded it with grass and the entire community then lost out. In many ways, I see that as the parable for what happened to the American dream after integration. Mm -hmm. Our public revenue as a share per capita, sorry, our, our average per capita Revenue, our tax Mm -hmm. base, peaked in 1965, meaning we collected more money for public investments in 1965 than we have ever since. Mm -hmm. 
the minimum wage peaked at that same time. Um, I looked into the social science research and it turns out that um, in 1956 and 1960, nearly 70% of white Americans believed a pretty radical idea. They thought that the government ought to provide a job for everyone who wanted one right. and guarantee a minimum income, a jobs guarantee and a universal basic income, right? These are far left ideas right now. Mm -hmm. But nearly 70% of white Americans thought, yeah, that's what the government should do. The government should make sure everybody has a decent standard of living. And that approval rating at 70% plummeted from 1960 to 1964, from nearly 70% to just 35%. And what happened between 1960 and 1964? It became clear that the Democratic Party was going to be the party of civil rights and that the rest of the economic policies and benefits that the New Deal Party was going to pursue were going to be done on a non-discriminatory basis for the first time in American history. And white Americans walked away from the pool. And they have never since, ever since Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, been um, the majority of white Americans have not voted for a Democrat since the party became the party of civil rights under Lyndon Johnson. And so in literal ways, they walked away from the pool um, with a, you know, a devastating impact for those communities. And then in terms of the pool of resources that would be shared to create the kinds of common sense investments that we know help secure a good quality of life. White Americans lost support for those ideas and for the political party that so often moved those ideas. Yeah, there's a scene that you described in, in the chapter, Racism Drain the Pool, which of course you just pointed out how it, it opens the book as a, as a parable for so many other things uh, that Americans have lost as a result of racism. But this older couple, that's a, that was in Birmingham. Do I have that right? And you were- looking, That was in Montgomery. Yeah. In Montgomery, right. You were looking for um, this once- grand historic pool that had been uh, been buried. Just tell us a little bit, because I, I think giving a real sense, uh, both at the personal level and also the landscape itself, the literal ground we walk on, you mean, it has the bones, <laughs> you know, of, of the choices that we've made. Yeah. Um, I actually keep here on my desk something. You raise it for me when you, when you talk about the literal landscape. So I, I went to Montgomery, Alabama, where... Um, one of the grandest pools in the South in Oak Park, which was the name of the sort of main park in the center of Montgomery, um, was drained and filled in and seeded over in order to defy a desegregation order in 1959. So I went to visit it to try to sort of just see what it was like, because the Montgomery Parks and Recreation Department, the entire Parks and Rec Department of the city closed in order to not have integrated recreation. And it stayed closed for a decade, 10 years without public parks, without recreation centers. They even sold off the animals in the zoo. You said they never filled in the pool. Yeah. Um, so um, even after the city of Montgomery reopened its parks and recreation department and, and reopened Oak Park, they never rebuilt the pool. So I went to go walk the grounds of where it used to be. Um, this was this huge, beautiful park and there were just a handful of people, groundskeepers outnumbered, you know, people who were visiting it. And I, I, I saw a couple, a white couple, elderly white couple sitting in a car. And I was excited because I thought, well, these folks are old enough that they might actually have a first person memory of this experience. Um, so I walked up to them and uh, they were, to put it mildly, not excited to talk to me at all. Um, I don't know why, um, but they did. It, I asked them, you know, are you from around here? Sort of curt nods, yes. Um, I said, do you remember when there used to be a big pool here? And they said, yes, of course. And I said, do you know where it was? And they ended up pointing directly ahead of them, right, where their car was parked, where they'd been sort of sitting 
and talking. And I got excited for a minute. I thought, oh my gosh, like maybe this is where they met as teenagers. Maybe this is a place they come. Maybe, you know, I'm imagining this sort of flood of shared stories that would come spilling out of them. And they just, the man rolled up the window and, you know, looked away and was really not open to talking to me about it. And that's so much of the story. There's not plaques to commemorate where racism drained the pool. There is a sign, a historical marker in Oak Park. It, it, it does mention, you know, the 10 years that the entire system was closed, but they don't mention racism. They just say a federal court deemed our recreation codes unconstitutional. And so the park was closed. Um, I did grab a handful of, of these acorns from the oak trees that line Oak Park just to remember the way in which the past is still with us and rebirthing all the time, right? These are these acorn seeds of trees that do remember when racism drained the pool in Montgomery. Yeah, yeah I just thought it was such a powerfully evocative scene uh, that you describe in, in your journey because this is as much a book of reporting, of, of firsthand uh, uh, reporting and, and a journalistic treatment uh, of what happened in these places as much as it is drawing on the the wisdom of others who've studied these problems for a long time, as well as the grassroots organizers uh, who are trying to, to battle. Each chapter has uh, this confluence of both seeing the past up close, of telling the past as it happened, uh, of seeing uh, to use an, an old story construction, the villains in our present, uh, and at the same time to see those protagonists who are fighting uh, against the villainy in our moment. So I want to turn to uh, some of the meat and potatoes of the analysis, uh, because you, you, each chapter really points out the loss. You just described this, you know, people watching this program, I'd be like, ah, you know, pools, whatever, right? Like, not such a big deal. I mean, I hope not. But, but, but nevertheless, one could imagine that in the hierarchy uh, of needs that, that, that pools wouldn't be high on it. But yet, the next chapter is, is about college education and healthcare, care yeah. uh, and the consequences of a society um, increasingly designed to keep some out with collateral consequences uh, for others. So just, just share with us a little bit more about the impact uh, to white people who are not elites when it comes to uh, the public goods that they've lost over the past several decades? My book opens with the question, why does it seem like we can't have nice things? Um, And by nice things, I'm not talking about laundry that does itself, which would be very nice. But I'm talking about, you know, reliable, well-funded infrastructure, public schools with adequate resources in every neighborhood, Universal health care, which every other advanced economy has, um, pov- wages that keep workers out of poverty. These are the kinds of things that not only Americans of color, who are disproportionately among the impoverished and the uninsured, but also white Americans, who are the majority of the impoverished and uninsured, are going without. And so after I lay out Um, the way that racism drained the pool, literally and also figuratively in terms of white Americans after integration really politically turning their backs on the party of the New Deal, turning their backs on the idea of a high tax, high investment growth strategy, turning their backs on the idea of the kinds of public benefits that frankly made for white prosperity in the course of the 20th century. I trace at one point all of the the free stuff that white Americans have gotten from the government over time, from the Homestead Act to the GI Bill and how racially exclusive all of that was. And when it was time to share the pool, that was the turning away from the idea of government and any kind of collective action. I also include a chapter on labor unions and collective bargaining and how um, I traveled to Mississippi and talked to workers who said very blatantly, the white workers vote against the union because they think the black workers are for it. And so the things that are included in that pool, that figurative pool that we all need, and that would be such a springboard for economic prosperity for everyone, regardless of race, are things like debt-free college, which used to be the norm in the United States because the government paid for the cost of college paid the schools to operate and then tuition was low and you could get a grant 
not an interest-bearing loan, a grant in order to pay your way to, through that small tuition and living costs. Um, that really changed over the time when the student-going population became more diverse. People don't call out the idea that racism is driving up the cost of college, but in so many ways, it truly is. People are more clear about the impact of racism as what is stopping us from getting truly universal, affordable health care in this country, both from the way that the Southern Dixiecrats stopped Harry Truman from his first idea, the first time he proposed, first time a president proposed a national health insurance plan. It was the Southern Dixiecrat Democrats who blocked it and wouldn't go along with the leader of their own party, mm -hmm. to today when we have an almost there solution, which is known as Obamacare, which the majority of white Americans have opposed overwhelmingly since it was passed. It's never reached a 50% approval rating. The idea of having this kind of pretty modest healthcare um, system improvement for, you know, Americans of all races to the idea of expanding Medicaid, which is a piece of the Affordable Care Act that was struck down as a universal thing by a state's rights theory by the Supreme Court, and which soon after it became optional for states, the states mostly from the con former Confederacy rejected it. And there's a correlation between how many Black people live in a state and how opposed the white people in that state are to expanding Medicaid to make sure that people making $10,000 an hour, $15,000 an hour have health care and can afford to see a doctor. So these are the ways that racism drains the figurative pool and stops us all from having nice things. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to give you back your term, it's not even figurative because in the context, as you write, of healthcare, it is about pooled risk. Yeah. The, the way that you drive down healthcare costs is that everyone has healthcare mm -hmm. and therefore uh, the sickest among us to the healthiest among us even out the cost of care, mm -hmm. in which case the only people winning in this broken system are yet again elites, the, pr pr the practitioners as well as the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. You have this, you know, incredible passage from Du Bois uh, and in other ways where in some ways, if we're going to use the actuarial metaphor of risk, of pooled risk, what white people are perceiving in Obamacare or the expansion of Medicare or in a public pool or in unionizing with black workers is the risk of losing something about how they think their position and status and status in society is propped up. You, you have this term, last place aversion, is that right, that you, you quote from somebody? Uh, maybe talk just a, a moment about that. Once a society is set up in a way where there isn't a minimum comfortable standard of living, there isn't a guarantee of a decent quality of life, you know, I see this very much in contrast with um, the you know Nordic model of social democracies where every family knows that they can send their kid to a good public school. They have paid family leave. Um, they have universal health care. They have a robust retirement system. The things that keep American families up at night that we're all sort of hustling to try to do on our own are kind of just guaranteed. And then you live your life on top of that sort of sense that there's a floor, that there's not so far you can fall into privation and, and, and struggle. That is not how our society was created. Our society was created with a bottom that was hell, literally hell, right? Um, and I do believe that when you create a bottom of your economy that is paid zero, that is legally allowed to be tortured, raped, and murdered. You are creating a sense among people who are a few rungs above that, who are the just normal working class, not the people who are the epitome of rightslessness, which were Black people both under slavery and under Jim Crow and Northern Moors in segregation, where the people just above that last place are viscerally defensive of their spot above that place. Now, there's a choice 
that people have. And I, and I talk about this in the chapter around labor solidarity because there was very much a choice as waves of white ethnic immigrants came at a time of a lot of you know, union organizing um, and labor organizing and labor radicalism, they could have said, well, you know what, let's fight, let's join hand in hand and link arms with the people at the bottom of this economic hierarchy and recognize that there's power in numbers, recognize that if we're all together in a union, the boss can't pick any one of us off, right? They need our labor ultimately. Um, and make the wage floor and the sort of floor of human dignity higher for everyone. That was available to Americans in our history. And generally speaking, it was rejected. The pull of the, the myth of racial difference, um, the, the, the wages of whiteness, as Du Bois says in Black Reconstruction, um, that were offered to white people, which was sort of like a, just a mental esteem. The idea that you're not now on the bottom of a class hierarchy, you're on the top of a racial hierarchy. And isn't that a better place to be? And what are you willing to give up to maintain that racial system that you're on top of? Well, you're not going to challenge the class hierarchy too, too much. You're going to sort of individuate um, and, and sort of believe the idea, um, you know, supported and propped up by a whole bunch of free government benefits. Um, you're going to believe the idea that your uh, your upward mobility and your trajectory is something that you alone can control um, and that your place in society is a reflection of your inherent worth. So that kind of psychology, last place aversion is, is one of the names for it. Uh, group status threat is another name for it, zero sum. These are all these different dimensions of the way in which a brutally hierarchical society where we do allow people to you know, lose a job and then lose everything. And the social safety net is so threadbare. And that white Americans in general, as a majority in terms of the public opinion, sort of cheer the decimation of the social safety net because there's this idea that um, it's become very racialized, the social safety net, particularly under, under Reagan um, and the conservatives, you know, in his wake, that we, that there's something wrong with people who are poor, broken, struggling, um, and that therefore you get a status boost by um, disaffiliating yourself from them. Yeah. Well, we are just about out of time. So I'm going to ask you one final question, and I think you'll have a couple minutes uh, to answer it. So um, you didn't name the book uh, The Solidarity Dividend. Um, so I, I would love for you uh, to round us out with just uh, a sense of how you imagine we move forward and the choices that people should be making um, in 2021 and beyond. Thank you. I want to thank you for this conversation. It's been so beautiful and sparked new ideas for me while we've been talking. Um, so I did, in the course of my journey, start to refer to something I was seeing as a solidarity dividend. It's this idea of the gains that we can unlock for all of us, but only by working together across lines of race, only by rejecting the zero sum, only by rejecting the divide and conquer strategy that really only ever benefits those at the top and those who are benefiting from the economic status quo. I saw signs of the solidarity dividend pretty much everywhere I went. And that's why ultimately I'm a hopeful person. And the book is actually one that, while, you know, like this country moving through, you know, the most abject uh, ugliness and struggle also includes so much resilience and ultimately hope. Because I do believe that there's nothing we can't accomplish together, but that we've got to reject the lie that our fellow Americans should be disdained and distrusted because of their skin color. We've got to reject the lie of a hierarchy of human value that some groups of people are better than others and reject the lie that there's not enough to go around, particularly in a society where even during a pandemic that cost all of us so much billionaires have still managed to profiteer during this pandemic. It's just one of the many examples of the fact that there is enough to go around that by uniting across lines of race, we can actually start to make sure we all have nice things. Um, 
I, I talked to a number of workers in Kansas City who were fast food workers who were organizing in a multiracial organization for $15 an hour and a union for fast food workers. And I talked to this young one woman named Bridget, who's sort of your typical white working class woman. You know, she said that she kind of believed the anti-immigrant, anti-Black stuff that she heard on the radio and from her family. And she also never thought, never thought that she was going to make $15 an hour. There's sort of a way in which once you believe those degraded stereotypes about other people in your same class position, it sort of lowers the horizon for what you can imagine for yourself. And then she joined ARMS, she linked up ARMS with and began organizing with black and brown workers, seeing herself in them. And she just explicitly said, I've now realized that it's not so much about an us and a them. It's that for all of us to come up, we've got to help each other. It's not about me coming up and then being pushed down. It's really about all of us rising together. And we've got to realize that racism has a cost for white people too, because it keeps us divided from our brown and black brothers and sisters. Those are her words, not yeah. mine. So yeah. I am hopeful. Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, any act of, of, of communication, of storytelling um, is, is an act of hope that someone will one day read this work. And I think that anyone who picks up your new book will be richly rewarded. Uh, and so I want to thank you so much for writing it and for taking the time to be on Afterwards today. It was a joy for me uh, to read the book in advance of, of it coming out uh, soon. And, uh, and congratulations, Heather. Really terrific. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so moved. Thank you so much. Um, I can't wait for our next conversation. Absolutely. Heather McGee on her book, The Sum of Us, on this week's Afterwards podcast. Afterwards is a weekly hour-long conversation about nonfiction books. Find us wherever you get your podcasts.